Support for LAist comes from the American French Film Festival. One week of French films and series premieres beginning October 29th at the Directors Guild of America in Hollywood, presenting 60 new French films and series. More at TAFFF.org. LAist and Show and Tell present an evening with David Sedaris. The writer, humorist, and radio contributor will take the stage Saturday, November 16th at the United Theater on Broadway. Tickets and information at LAist.com slash events. It's Air Talk on LAist 89.3. I'm Larry Mantle, really looking forward to what our critics have to say next hour about the new film from writer-director Sean Baker, Honora, the story of a sex worker from Brooklyn who meets and marries the son of an oligarch, and his parents aren't too happy about the union. The film goes from there, and we'll hear about the movie starring Mikey Madison. It was the winner of the Cannes Film Festival's top honors at their recent festival, Honora from Sean Baker. Also, the horror film Smile 2, which has gotten some good advance word. We'll hear what Amy Nicholson has to say about that, as well as uh, a new film that stars Kate Blanchett and Charles Dance titled Rumors. Those and more films to be reviewed on Film Week less than an hour from now here on LAS 89.3. But we want to turn our attention right now for the very latest on the federal investigation as well as the lawsuits that have been filed against Orange County Supervisor Andrew Doe. As you likely know, LAist senior reporter Nick Gerda broke this story about uh, Andrew Doe funneling uh, more than a million uh, dollars uh, to nonprofit organizations uh, that had uh, leadership listed to his daughter. Uh, there's a purchase of a home that's involved. There have been raids on houses involved uh, with principals in the investigation. Nick's with us just to sort of bring us up to date on where we stand right now with these multiple activities. Nick, good morning. Good morning, Larry. Thanks for having me on. Um, so yes, there's a, there's a number of things going on. We know there are um, active uh, criminal investigations into this. That's according to court filings in the county's um, lawsuit alleging a fraud conspiracy um, around uh, what happened with these millions of dollars that the county says have gone unaccounted for. Um, Supervisor Doe has not been attending the county board of supervisors meetings for the last couple of months since those federal searches took place at a home owned by him and his wife, who is the number two ranked judge in Orange County, the assistant presiding judge, uh, Sherry Pham. Uh, and searches were also t uh, conducted at the home of owned by their 23-year-old um, daughter, Rhiannon Doe, and she's been listed on and off as a leader of this nonprofit group, uh, Viet America Society, that Supervisor Doe directed the funds to. Um, and we now have new reporting out uh, this morning um, that we, we just broke the story that uh, we've s discovered in court records, public court filings um, in the lawsuit, you know, going through dozens and dozens of pages. Uh, we discovered that there's this reference to the fact of a uh, federal grand jury investigating this situation and calling um, witnesses uh, from this nonprofit group, subpoenaing them to testify. Um, the founder of the group, Peter Pham, and the chief financial officer, Din Mai, um, and uh, this basically was brought up by their own attorney in this uh, this civil lawsuit, um, and the, their attorney is arguing that the lawsuit should be put on hold, frozen, until the criminal invest investigations wrap up. Uh, and the, their attorney, also, who's also the attorney for Supervisor Doe's daughter, Rhiannon Doe, told the court in these, these court filings that um, his clients uh, face the threat of criminal prosecution. Um, so it, it speaks to the apparent seriousness, according to their own attorney, uh, of the um, federal investigation into what's uh, going on. And at this point, there's no um, indication that we've seen in, you know, in the public sphere of, of any um, criminal charges that have been filed or um, accusations of crimes by authorities, um, but it certainly seems to be a very active um, investigation into what's what's going on. And Nick, just to clarify, the, the lawsuits you're talking about, are, the, are these the lawsuits filed by Orange County uh, against the nonprofit to try and claw back the funds that were provided? Exactly. Yes. This, these lawsuits were filed um, in August, uh, mid-August, uh, following months of our investigative articles at LAist um, and uh, follow-up 
investigation by the county internally into uh, what happened with these funds. They repeatedly asked the nonprofit to account for what happened to the money. A significant amount of this money, which was meant to feed needy seniors during the pandemic, um, records show that it was forwarded or sent to private businesses who, that are run by the same people who uh, were in charge of the nonprofit group. And, and that's where a lot of the, basically the paper trail on the funds um, disappeared as far as the county uh, the county's awareness of what happened to the money. And we've, we've asked repeatedly for the nonprofit to explain those payments and, and detail what happened, and, and we haven't gotten answers. So eventually, um, the county uh, kept demanding, again, that, that uh, this nonprofit do the, an audit that was required that was long overdue. The nonprofit fired their own auditors um, when the auditors said that there was they weren't able to do the audit because of the lack of uh, documentation. And the county ultimately um, filed loss, a lawsuit in August alleging a fraud conspiracy by Supervisor Doe's daughter and other uh, leaders of this nonprofit um, to divert f divert divert the funds um, into personal use, personal benefit, um, including um, purchases of million dollar homes and renovations to those homes. Um, I'll just say the county lawsuit, it doesn't have a lot of direct, it doesn't really have direct evidence um, linking the money to those home purchases, but the county um, states that they were they were informed that that's the case. They believe it to be true, and and they made those allegations in the lawsuit. and And they point to their you know extensive efforts, as they describe it, to uh, you know get it, get the information from the nonprofit about what happened to the funds and the lack of answers um, as um, indicative of of um, supporting their allegations of fraud. Um, the nonprofit, by the way, you know disputes those allegations. Um, they say they've done no no wrongdoing. Their leaders have, have done nothing wrong. Um, and it's now playing out actually at a hearing. There's a hearing in the lawsuit uh, this afternoon in San Diego um, on whether to put a freeze on the assets of the nonprofit and its leaders. Uh, and the judge in that case yesterday said she is inclined to uh, grant the county's request to put a freeze on assets. Hmm. And and Nick, do you know, are there actual assets still held by the nonprofit um, or is that money not visible anywhere? You know, we don't know exactly um, how much is in their accounts, um, but uh, we do know that their their lawyer has said both to the press and in these court filings that federal authorities, the FBI and the IRS, put a freeze on their bank accounts for the nonprofit, as well as a restaurant closely associated with the nonprofit, and um, uh, one or two, I think two of their uh, leaders, their their bank accounts were frozen by federal authorities. So certainly, um, it appears federal um, investigators found um you know, just decided that there was a worthwhile step on their end to put a freeze on um, their accounts. And Nick, approximately how long ago were those federal warrants served and the homes of Supervisor Doe and his wife and their daughter searched? Yeah, that was about two months ago. Um, it was on August 22nd. Um, and at the time and since then, federal authorities and law enforcement at the local level at the DA's office have been ex extremely tight-lipped about what they're looking at, they've they've declined to say anything about what they're investigating, who they're investigating. Um, the only thing they would confirm is that there is some kind of investigation involving federal prosecutors, the FBI, the IRS Criminal Division, and the Orange County District Attorney's Office, and they would confirm the locations that were searched that day, um, but nothing about uh, what they were looking looking at into. Uh, we did see one of my re colleagues, uh, like reporter Jill Replogel and um, Adolfo Guzman Lopez and Yusuf Farzan fanned out that day to um, be outside those homes while they were being searched um, in many of those locations. And uh, they saw a lot of materials being carried out by federal agents in bags and boxes. So um, it does appear that there was some um, several items seized as well as the uh, phone of the founder of the nonprofit group, uh, Peter Pham. The reason I was asking about the date is, you know, we, we know how long federal investigations usually take. So I was a little surprised to see that the grand jury has already been convened and witnesses are coming in because um, I might have expected that uh, things that had been seized, if they if they thought it was evidence of criminal activity, that would also be submitted to the grand jury in pursuit of indictments. The fact this has come within a couple months after the searches of those homes, that, I mean, it seems to me, at least based on other federal cases, to be rather quick. Yeah, it does these things do seem to be moving quickly. Um, federal investigations are known to often take many years. In, in Orange County, actually, there was a public corruption investigation um, that actually is still ongoing that it looked into um, corruption in the city of Anaheim and uh, Irvine. And in that, in that case, there was uh, 
about three or four years between when they describe initial um, wiretaps, things like that, and when they um, when there was public announcements of activity in that case. So these things are known to take quite a while. Um, but we don't what we don't know is how long the grand jury has been uh, convened. Um, oftentimes, these grand juries, I think they can meet meet for up to a year or sometimes longer. Um, and so the, it's possible this has been going on for many months, and we're just now getting mm. a glimpse into the process. Nick, thank you so much. And I know you continue to cover this story very closely with any other developments that we have. You'll be right back on the air here at LAist 89.3 and your writing will be at LAist.com. Thank you again. Incredible work that you and and LAist colleagues have, have done on this. You and your editor, Mary Plummer, taking the lead on this. Thousands and thousands of documents, uh, uncountable hours. Maybe you've counted it, but it's an <laughs> extraordinary output of work sure is. that you've done, and we're all very grateful for the journalism that, that you've done with, with the LAist team. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Larry. Support for LAist comes from the American French Film Festival. One week of French films and series premieres, October 29th through November 3rd at the Directors Guild in Hollywood. Films include The Count of Monte Cristo and an opening night gala screening of Emilia Perez, France's official selection for the Academy Awards. Free screenings and events include the short films and television competitions, happy hour talks, and an educational program. More info about the American French Film Festival is at taff.org. LAist and Show and Tell present An Evening with David Sedaris. The humorist, comedian, author, and radio contributor will take the stage at the United Theater on Broadway to share insights, read from both published and unpublished work, and host a live Q&A with the audience, followed by a book signing. It's Saturday, November 16th at the United Theater. Tickets and information at LAist.com slash events. It's Air Talk on LAS 89.3. Our thanks again for your generous support of the journalism you hear 24 7 on LAS 89.3 and always at LAS.com. The LA 84 Foundation was created out of the hugely successful Los Angeles Olympics of 1984, and the charge of the LA 84 Foundation is to keep the great opportunities going for the youth of greater Los Angeles in the decades after the Games. And that's exactly what the foundation has done. An important part of their mission is a sports participation survey for youth. They've been doing this since 2016. And this year, they've released a first-of-its-kind statewide report on the equity gap in recreation for kids. Joining us is Renata Simrel. She's president and CEO of the LA84 Foundation. Renata, so good to have you back with us. We well, appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. It's glad to be with you this morning. So there's some findings here that are really cause for concern, including the rather shocking percentage of kids who have no physical activity all week long. How, how can this be happening? Yes. You know, let me just uh, start by maybe defining play equity for the listeners. It's the concept of ensuring that all children, regardless of their background or where they live, that they have equality of access to play opportunities, sport program, and healthy movement. And it recognizes that play is essential for a child's physical, emotional, social, and academic development, and that disparities in sport and play can perpetuate inequities in other areas. And so this is what we have defined a crisis that's no longer hiding in plain sight with the state survey. But the fond findings um, in the survey are striking. 66% um, of California kids don't get the CDC guidelines for recommended activity uh, on a weekly basis. Which and is 60 minutes a day is recommended. Exactly, 60 minutes a day. And 10% of California children don't get exercise at all during the week. And when you think about um, the statistics of the obesity rate, stress, anxiety, depression, um, the sense of belonging and isolation that the Surgeon General talks about, the U.S. Surgeon General talks about, you know, our work in leveling the playing field so all kids have access is critically important because physical activity, movement, sport, play 
um, really addresses these challenges that young people are facing. Rates of physical activity are lowest for Latinas and African American females, Latino kids in general, youth with disabilities, youth in households with annual incomes of $50,000 a year or lower, and youth in Inland Empire communities. These are the ones that are, are disproportionately at lower levels of participation. Right. So what do what do we understand? Are there, I mean, all kids, there's this competition from social media and video games, which we've seen this as a trend in recent years. But what about facilities? What about coaching? What about assistance with the cost of, of equipment to play team sports, for example? Um, how big a gap are we seeing? It's a, a, a very big gap of households with earning $50,000 um, or less um, a year. They're least like their kids are least likely to pay, play, and you mentioned the statistics around um, Latino and Black girls. Um, if they're in a household with multiple children, girls are usually the ones that won't play. The boy will be the first, you know, that a parent will engage in play. And you know, as I shot, cited the importance of sport play and movement for our physical and mental well-being, um, you know, access at school. Um, the survey has really lifted up the inequities that exist in our public schools. Uh, PE is an unfunded mandate. Most Which I didn't realize, and I saw most parents don't realize. I had no idea that it was unfunded. And our good friend, Senator Josh Newman from Orange County, um, last year uh, uh, put legislation into mandate recess for 30 minutes, and then it couldn't be taken away for punishment. So the governor signed that into law this June. And so until this year, schools could choose whether or not they did recess or not. Um, after school sports program, some schools have them, many schools don't, and there's six million kids in the state of California's public schools. And so the inequities within our school system was really highlighted in this statewide survey. Um, and so the efforts that we're now working with our state legislators to sort of arrest some of these issues through legislative priorities like recess um, bill that Josh Newman passed, PE as a fully funded mandate. You know, I think um, the survey also re revealed that Parents, 95% of parents, support public funding for school-based um, sports uh, and after-school sports and sort of community-based organizations. When I was growing up in Inglewood, we had uh, park leagues that, you know, most of us played. It was totally free. There was no equipment cost in it. It was all funded by the city of Inglewood. And, and so you'd have at the different regional parks, and we'd play against each other. And even for those of us that were, you know, far from elite athletes but just liked to play, it was a great opportunity and really brought kids together. And it just seems like that sort of all community play is is much harder to find now. You have these sort of more elite leagues and travel teams and all this yeah. stuff for kids who are really good. But for just, you know, the rest of us, there's not much there. That's right. I mean, I grew up in the city of Carson and it was twenty five dollars and I could play all the sports during the summers. You know, the equivalency today, um, you know, in our city park and recreation system is probably one hundred and fifty dollars, um, you know, per per sport. And that's really cost prohibitive for a lot of parents. And so the work that we do on the foundation side of being a grant maker is we fund these organizations. You mentioned coaching education earlier so that they can provide free and low cost sports programs, play programs, you know, within the communities that are most underserved. Um, our Play Equity Fund, the charitable arm that we started um, that really um, started to highlight this play equity gap, you know, then focuses on the advocacy and the legislative and pu unlocking public resources that are needed in our public schools as one example. Um, but also in terms of statewide recess, res resources, I should say, to really support community-based organizations who are, you know, on the ground in the communities providing these free, low-cost um, uh, opportunities for kids to engage in play, to have the sense of belonging. And you also earlier mentioned coaching education, which is key. One of the findings in the, in the survey is that uh, 30 percent of the kids drop out of sports um, after two years of playing. Um, and it's at a younger age. It's starting to become at a younger age. And they cite that it's not fun. And a coach can be such a critical oh, yeah. you know, resource to make sure that kids are finding the fun of sports, finding that fun of belonging, 
Um, and so our, our resources help on the coaching education side as well. And parents have a responsibility there too, because sometimes parents are making it a bigger deal, you know, more and putting pressure on kids. We'll come back to that. Let me just reintroduce in case you just joined us, the president and CEO of the LA 84 Foundation founded out of the LA Olympic Games of 1984. Renata Simrel is with us. We're talking about their first ever statewide play equity report, uh, which surveyed more than a thousand families in California uh, to try and get a sense of, of what's the level of participation for those who aren't participating, what are the barriers or what are the challenges that are taking place. So, R- Renata, aside from the advocacy that you're talking about to try and increase funding and provide ways of closing this gap, what are some of the other ways that perhaps um, – parents can help to fill this gap or resources that are available for them, for example, with equipment costs? Are there funds available to help lower income families be able to pick up the cost of equipment? Yes. Yeah. And Larry, if I could, um, you made on the introduction um, that it's a parent survey. I think it's really important to note that we, this is a first of its kind statewide survey. And we not only surveyed parents, but we did youth focus groups. And so this, this, the data that we're uncovering is from the youth themselves of how they're experiencing sport, where they're showing up, where they're not showing up, and really their um, acknowledgement of the fact that not all sport play and movement activity is equal for you know, communities across the board. Um, where can parents um, lean in and get in? I think you um, made uh, the comment about ensuring that sport is fun. Um, I think looking for opportunities where your their kids can, you know, find programs, go on our website, la84.org. Um, we fund a number of organizations across the Southern California organization, so we'd be help, happy to connect parents um, to resources. But I think it's also being aware within the school-based um, context. So parents, the PTA groups should show up. Make sure that the schools are providing, you know, the adequate amount of time for recess during the day. Um, you know, maybe volunteer and help the PE, co- uh, PE teacher during PE, um, demanding after school sports. Our parents have so much, um, you know, power within our school system that if they show up and use their voice to say we want physical activity um, opportunities for our kids in school, I think that can go a long way um, to the advocacy work that we're doing um, on a daily basis to sort of level this playing field. Uh, Renata, if I'm not mistaken, you're a third generation Angelino, is that right? It is, and I heard you're a fourth I'm generation. I'm a fourth yeah, generation. You beat me by one. I have I have a fifth generation son who's uh, Angelino, and uh, you're product of local higher education, so you know you know these communities very well. To me. Every bit as important as the physical side of this, which is absolutely key for the mental and physical health of kids, but at the social aspects of this, playing with other kids, and not just in highly competitive, you know, elite leagues, but that just kids getting out all skill levels, playing together, playing against kids in other parts of the city. This is an important part of the social experience and has been part of the fabric of Southern California because we have people that have come from all over the world here. This is one of the ways they get to know each other. Without question. And, um, you know, I'm one of those kids that was this shy, uh, mixed-race middle school kid, and sport really brought a sense of belonging to, you know, me and my community. It helped me find my voice. While I, you know, aspired to be a professional athlete when I was growing up, that wasn't my course. But sports really helped me show up, particularly as a girl, um, with my confidence, with my voice, that I had my tribe. And so those are the things that we're trying to bring, you know, to communities that are um, under-resourced, um, you know, don't they lack access? Um, you know, I think it's also important um, to note that the power of sport, that sense of belonging, is lost if it's only available to privilege. And we all pay. Um, you mentioned earlier about the cell phone. Well, guess what? If you're in the swimming pool, you know, swimming competition, if you're on the uh, basketball court, if you're on the soccer pitch, you can't do that and be on your phone at the same time. You have to be in connection and in the sense of belonging with your teammates. And so we think it's a moral imperative that parents, teachers, uh, policymakers, that we really prioritize uh, sport play and movement um, in communities, in school, because our kids are desperate for uh, that 
sense of belonging, that sense of community that you get through sports. Renata, thank you so much for coming in and talking about this survey. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you for highlighting it. We are uh, incredibly grateful that it's no longer a crisis hiding in plain sight, and we encourage your listeners to get involved and go out and play with your kids. All right. Thanks so much. Renata Simrel joining us, president and CEO of the LA84 Foundation. Support for LAist comes from the American French Film Festival. One week of French films and series premieres, October 29th through November 3rd at the Directors Guild in Hollywood. Films include The Count of Monte Cristo and an opening night gala screening of Amelia Perez, France's official selection for the Academy Awards. Free screenings and events include the short films and television competitions, happy hour talks, and an educational program. More info about the American French Film Festival is at taff.org. I'm David Wagner, the housing reporter at LAist. More than 75,000 people are experiencing homelessness in L.A. County, according to the latest count. Measure A seeks to address the issue with a quarter-cent sales tax increase. I'm here to help you understand the proposal, and LAist will be here for you throughout this election season. Visit laist.com vote. It's Air Talk on LA at 89.3, and it's Food Friday in advance of Film Week. Today, we highlight breadhead sandwiches of Santa Monica, what's hoped to be a chain of sandwich shops using high quality ingredients and a wonderfully baked in house bread. Joining us, the co owners of Breadhead Sandwiches, Alex Williams and Jordan Snyder. Gentlemen, good to have you with us today. Thank Thanks you for having, having us. <laughs> so, you, you two came out of a Michelin starred restaurant, uh, Trois Mec. Share with us how you got the idea of going into the sandwich biz. All right. Well, uh, yeah, it was in the midst of the pandemic and we were all kind of like thinking, what's the next step here? And we knew uh, we loved sandwiches and we knew we could eat this uh, a couple times a week. So Jordan and I kind of looked around and saw the other sandwiches around town and uh, thought that there was some things missing and things that we could improve upon and applied our experience working in restaurants uh, and and apply it to to a simple thing like sandwiches. It was great. I'm just trying your mozzarella sandwich, so describe the ingredients, please. All right, so we have uh, fresh mozzarella, uh, pickled red onion, fresh alfalfa sprouts, avocado, and uh, za'atar mayo, all done on our signature focaccia bread. And and the sprouts is kind of a throwback, right? You don't tend to see sprouts as much in sandwiches, at least I don't, as, as you used to say back in the 80s. Yeah, you know, I, I grew up in California, and that was one kind of addition to a sandwich that I always appreciated and always added it to a sandwich Great that I texture. already liked. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so this one is kind of an ode to California and my wife is Lebanese and I had worked with Zatar before uh, bringing that at the home. And yeah, so we added that to it. So describe the bread is fantastic. It's got a great crunch, um, but coupled with a softness. I mean, it's 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 really terrific because some kind I don't know whether you call this a focaccia or what how you would uh, what term you would use. But sometimes it can be kind of hard, and this has just it. It has that. It doesn't require a lot to cause the crunch. That was what we set out to do: is create the best sandwich bread possible, and being crunchy without hurting your mouth. Right? Yeah. How many times have we eaten a a sandwich and just like torn your mouth apart, and it feels violating? Uh, So that was the idea around it: Uh, make something nice and crispy and uh and buttery and yeah we don't if i went to italy and called this focaccia i'd i get slapped but i like to make the correlation uh to something with our guests and 
that's the that's the best uh, comparison is focaccia. The, the combo that I just took a bite of has a nice little kick to it. Just subtle though, beautifully balanced. What's in the combo? All right, I'm gonna hand it over to my my business partner Jordan. Jordan yeah, to speak so on the, the combo. So the combo grinder kind of harkens back to our partner Mike's childhood. The combo grinder he grew up in uh, Connecticut, so. This is a real East Coast style Italian. So Matt, Matt, our producer, is nodding. He's from New Hampshire, so he knows this oh, sandwich. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So this is this is your neck of the woods. Um, this is mortadella, salami, uh, provolone, and then we got all like run it through the garden: tomatoes, roasted red peppers, pepperoncinis, iceberg lettuce, which we live and die by. It's our favorite. Of the lettuces. Well, iceberg lettuce gets such a bad rap. And, and I've even heard people say, well, it has no flavor. Uh, to me, iceberg has a very distinct flavor. Oh, it's juicy, crispy. I mean, it's it's we put it on most of our sandwiches. It's Thank you. Uh, yeah, we love no, it. No, I'm glad it's being rehabilitated. Yeah, exactly. And you know what? I don't want to see a BLT with anything besides iceberg lettuce. Bless you. Yeah. All right. Uh, we're talking with the uh, co-owners of Breadhead Sandwiches in Santa Monica. That's Jordan Snyder, from whom you just heard, and Alex Williams. Uh, and uh, they partnered with a couple of other uh, veterans of the restaurant scene. I know you, you have designs, as often people do, to take something from from one location and, and to build it up. What are some of the challenges, though, in doing that in this restaurant and investing environment? It's got to be tough to to go from one to multiple locations. Yeah, I mean, it is. It's a it's a challenge, and it's something that you know will probably be our biggest hurdle. But it it really matters to keep them true to what we want, which is great everyday food serving our neighborhood. So. You know, we're not we're not going to grow any quicker than we can ensure that the product, the stores are exactly what we set out to do, because this is, you know, Alex and and uh, myself. It's our baby. So and and pardon me, I'm still finishing from the BLT. Wow. Great crunch. I mean, all the way (laughs) every layer. Yeah, that is that is terrific. But it's it's. for example, the bread. I mean, this is such a specific product. Is this something that is going to be replicable when you're not on site? We think so. That's that's what we honestly set out to do from day one coming up with this concept is to create a product that's scalable, right? Jordan and I come from a fine dining background. We wanted to create something that we can teach and 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 grow some of our employees up and and teach them how to do this exact thing. So we, we haven't gotten lost in the, oh, we can only do this product. So we're already, uh, you know, teaching tons of our employees how to do this and and grow it and yeah. be able to to you know scale this that's the idea around it how many uh i asked that three sandwiches only be brought in because that's all i really have time to sample all are terrific but how many on a typical day do you offer at at the uh, restaurant yeah we have uh i believe 12 right now and then we during the week we have a daily special and that's a hot sandwich so all of our sandwiches are cold sandwiches and we have one hot special every day of the week. Now, being a sandwich shop, does that also, from a business standpoint, enable you to control the hours a bit as opposed to a fine dining restaurant? I mean, not yet. Okay. <laughs> but, yeah, the, the dream is that, you know, it'll be something that, like Alex said, scalable, that we can kind of hand off to the people that that are coming up with us. But, yeah, Alex and I have been... In the restaurant, because you have a lot. families, right? Exactly. I, yeah. yeah, and unfortunately, you know, we don't get to see them as much as we'd like. But we we think this is an investment in you know not only ours and our employees' future, but our families' future. Because often with sandwich places, you don't have to be open into the night hours. You know, you can close a little bit earlier and, exactly. and contain. Yeah, it's it's as close to a nine to five job as you probably get in the restaurant industry. All right. Hey, gentlemen, thank you for coming in. Terrific sandwiches. And and the ingredients are first rate. The bread is a knockout. Just 
dynamite. So, that means the world to us. Thank yeah, you. Thank no, you. the Thank texture, you. the crunch, the softness in addition to the crunch, really beautifully executed. It's from Breadhead Sandwiches in Santa Monica. The co-owners, Alex Williams and Jordan Snyder, joining us for Food Friday here on LA is 89.3. So glad to have you with us. LAist consistently delivers important news to Los Angeles and Orange County. Hi, I'm Jill Replogle, the Orange County correspondent at LAist. The fire that broke out in Tustin last November at a World War II era military hangar spewed asbestos into the surrounding community. For months, neighbors had crews in hazmat suits combing their front and backyards to safely remove debris. When I couldn't get a straight answer on just how far and where the toxic material had spread, I requested public documents, and we produced the only publicly available map that tracked reports of how far the debris had spread, about 10 miles from where the massive hangar burned for weeks. LAist, connecting you to your community. 